Hi everyone. Uh, this is a recording of a workshop I'm going to give tomorrow at the EdTech 2024 conference in Sligo. Uh, I'm recording it because what I'll be doing is I'll be sort of uh, crowdsourcing opinions through a Padlet that will be available after the workshop. So if you're listening to this recording, you can join in and give your opinions as well. Now, I've also said it would be crowdsourcing solutions, but it's a lot easier to identify barriers than to identify solutions. These are difficult problems. But anyway, let's get going. If you're interested in contributing your opinion on these barriers and their solutions, uh, I suppose this might be a useful exercise for you and you may learn of others as well. So let's see. Now, here I have sort of a list of my favorite innovations and innovative organizations actually because what I sort of want to do is draw your attention to the idea I want you to think about why is it that these innovations are not more widespread uh, I, by the way I've said improving lives because I believe a good innovation one that will improve the lives of the students or improve the lives of lecturers uh, if lecturers can have a better life maybe they can do more for students but anyway this is the list of sort of my favorite innovations and you may have other ones beyond this but the point is not so much what the innovations are is what's stopping us from doing these at scale or replicating them more widely so on the top left then there are free online education resources and there's tons of it worldwide there's no shortage of it but are we using them enough are we uh, leveraging or exploiting the open education resources? Are we exploiting the free courses, the MOOCs out there, so students can do those rather than take classes with us? There's, I mean, there's potentials for savings there, even access to better, better education. Why aren't we using them more within higher education? Now, the second one I've said, one of my favorite innovations is the virtual learning environment. And a lot of people complain about that. And to be honest with you, that one is that is highly used some of the basic functionality, maybe not some of the more advanced functionality. You know. But for those of you that complain about it is, I remember what it was like before we had these tools that allow us to bring everything together and it wasn't good. So they ha actually have improved things enormously as far as I'm concerned. Um, degrees at scale. Well, I'm a big fan of bringing down the cost of higher education. So what Georgia Tech and others have been doing in getting degrees at scale, I think is a great innovation. I think we'd need to do a lot more of it. What's stopping us teaching degrees to thousands of students at a time? Flipped learning. Why should people just sit in class, listen to a lecture when they can just listen to a recording? They can even interact with that recording or take quizzes afterwards to uh, sort of record their level of attention, to encourage more attention, and then use the classroom time for more, let's say, productive uh, activities. Why isn't that? more common. Peer assessment is a tool. And uh, In fact, to be honest with you, I'll jump forward because I think I have grading and feedback down there at the bottom as well. Will I just get out of the way here? Grading and feedback tools. And I would consider fee peer assessment to be one of those. Why aren't we using these ways of getting feedback to students much faster, reducing our workload and getting it to students much faster. And I've kept your assessments separate because I sort of believe that um, by doing assessment uh, or giving feedback to other students, uh, students actually learn a lot as well. So it's a great it's a great learning uh, methodology as well. Over here on the left, we've got spaced practice. I, I should say automatic grade, auto graded assessments mostly objective tests, to be honest, which are multiple choice quizzes, but a really impactful way or a way of getting great value out of these is to do them at these specified intervals that improve the recall of the student. If they're done like that, and there is software to do that, but it's hardly ever used. Online exams is another one uh, below the VLE here, another one that a lot of people are complaining about. But if you've taught distance learners like I have for years, they really appreciate online exams and whatever uh, whatever intrusion on their privacy is there, they seem to be well able to handle it and think it's well worth it. They get themselves private places to do it. They like to do online exams because traveling really is not, not an option for them a lot of the time. Stackable micro-credentials, 
usually I would say in digital credential format. To be honest with you, I'm a little bit disappointed with the progress on these. I sort of theoretically feel that there's huge potential in them, but I can see a lot of barriers to their usage, a lot of difficulties in their usage. So maybe these are barriers we can overcome, but I, I think the basic core idea is a great thing that people can build up their credentials gradually. Uh, and the spirit of lowering the cost of education, universities, there's a few of them around that give it completely free and just charge for examinations. University of the People is possibly the most well known. Basically, the learning is there for the people to take for free. Really, the assessment is where the workload. Why aren't we doing more of that? in higher education. I better get out again, out of the way again here. Uh, I'm name a couple of institutions other than university people. Southern New Hampshire has done great work in the US at reducing just the cost of higher education. Uh, and one of the things they've done to help with that is uh, they've really looked at recognition of prior learning in terms of prior certification from college. So making sure students get credit for uh, courses they've taken in the past. I, I would like to mention Arizona State University and in a way they've just done loads of in, innovations. One of them is to accept everyone. Very novel, the idea that there's no entry requirements as it were. Uh, but it does mean that they have people of all sorts of different abilities and they're using adaptive learning systems to deal with that. That's only a, a couple of examples of their innovations. They are innovating on a lot of fronts there. Uh, Project-based degrees and, and there's a degree in civil engineering at Charles Sturt University. Again, this is like flipped learning on steroids. Why would they be sitting in class learning certain mathematical topics or mechanics or whatever? When that can all be done by video and checked by quizzes, when they really, what we really want them is working on projects. Uh, this will give them more time to work on projects and give the lecturers more time to concentrate in helping them with projects. Do they need to come to college at all for a lot of these things? Could we design degrees where they don't come to campus and they're just in the workplace? A bit like the UK higher apprenticeships, but I think we can, even in the UK higher apprenticeships, I think they can use technology a lot more. Uh, I mentioned grading and feedback tools. And the last one I've put in is AI, because to some extent, I think AI is overhyped, uh, but the other, extent I think it will have a massive effect in the past really all I've seen in the past is adaptive learning which is tricky uh, but what it can do with generative AI looks very promising so I suppose we can't blame institutions for not doing much with generative AI so far it's fairly new but we can imagine what the barriers will be to getting them to use it more Okay, so what are these barriers? Now, the idea here is that you decide what the barriers are, but for because we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna suggest what I perceive as the barriers, and you can knock those down or support those or add more as you wish. So this will get us started, as it were. Okay, is it leadership without a vision? Is it lack of management skills? Is that where the problem lies in leadership and management? I won't go into any more details. Is it our processes? Is it the way that we do governance and decision making? Is collegiality the idea that everybody has a say and we maybe just go with the speed of the slowest person who says no for the longest? Okay, um, is it central? Some people say it's centralization that it doesn't allow us to uh, innovate at the margins, and other people say it's silos that we're too. Uh, separated in departments and we're not working together enough. Are these the sort of things that are um, uh, proving to be barriers? For those of us that have been involved in innovation and higher education for a while, maybe we have ourselves to blame that we have these ideas, but we're not communicating them well to lecturers or to uh, department heads or to leadership. We're not persuading them uh, of where the real value is in these. Um, is it just a culture that we just go on that we are the culture in our organizations is resistant to change? Uh, again, this I suppose this is communication as well, persuading colleagues. When I go to persuade lecturers or others to do things, 
are there reasons why it's difficult to do that? Like, have they had previous bad experiences of change? Are they right to resist change? Or is it the opposite, uh, the hubris? This idea that they're experts in their own area and then they think they're experts in teaching and learning as well. And they will tell you, no, no, I, I know how to teach best. Don't come to me and telling me how to do it better. Or maybe they do admit that, uh, that they can learn from others, but they say, I don't have time to get the skills. I don't have the skills to do it. Or is it just that they are in safe jobs and can't be bothered? And the last one I have there is workload because there might be willing, they may have the skills, but it's just they're overworked with what they already have to do. They don't have the time to do it. So that possibly comes down to funding then as well. Now, I mentioned technology infrastructure. Do we have the money for that? To be honest with you, I don't think that's a problem because there's good infrastructure there as well already. Do they have support? I think we have a lot of support staff and in institutions. Uh, um, but you could say funding, and I haven't it listed here, is it maybe uh, uh, to free up their time to take in other lectures to do work so that they have time to do innovation work. Now, this is one that I do seriously think is a problem is do our regulations encourage innovation? Are there too many detailed regulations then to say, no, you can't do this, this, this and this, even though if you have an innovative solution, you can do those things uh, and make up for the negative impact of those in other ways. Are regulations too tight in terms of um, in terms of innovation um, and change? Could it be representative groups that are just look a self interest of these groups, whether it be academic committees that don't want to change, or trade unions? They have reasons to keep things the same, or to use change as a bargaining tool to get better conditions. Could it be fear of failure? That's individuals that don't want to fail, take something on and fail. Or it could be the organizations that want to take on bigger pro projects and uh, and fail at them. Uh, could it be protectionism that basically if you allow innovations in a certain way, it could threaten your profession? If you were just say we were, and I don't know if this is true or not, by the way, if you were to increase the supply of a particular medical professional by two or three times by becoming more efficient? Would that flood the market? Would it reduce the salaries they could get? They may not want to actually increase uh, capacity. Could it be national funding and how it works? And that could be um, that there's not enough funding or could it be the nature of the funding, the rules, with, what are, I like student grants and things like that, that um, student grants are only given to students who are on courses that are delivered in a certain way. If you come up with a new way of delivery, they'll say, oh, no, no, that's not uh, entitled to a student grant. So that innovation is killed dead because of this national funding rule. I suppose it's part of regulations, national regulations and things like that. Or it could be the way that they fund innovation, that the people who are doling out the funds and scoring it don't know as much as maybe they should and they're more interested in making sure that the money is spent legally rather than it being spent effectively. In other words, are we giving funding to projects that really have a genuine impact? How, how do they measure that impact? Uh, maybe they should change funding so that uh, the funding is based on impact rather than uh, based on activity. Is it the expectations? Now, this is a, a sort of a in a way, a subtle one or a secondary one is that you can come up with an innovation. But if employers don't recognize this as good, they may not employ this, the, the graduates of this particular innovation because they don't see the value. They don't understand the value. They expect it to be as it's always been. Um, uh, could it be that parents then would worry that well, what if this doesn't work? Will my kids get jobs? And the students themselves. In other words, they have expectations to see higher education as it always was. And if you do something differently, they can't necessarily see the value in that. Could it be that we all come from different professional backgrounds and we have a bias that tends towards the practices in our background? Now, I could give a whole talk on that because I have seen this sort of bias in all sorts of areas. But 
we'll just put it down as that for the moment. Okay, so those are lots of possible barriers, we'll say. So what I want you to do now is I want you to go to this Padlet. Now in the workshop, uh, the participants will have already gone to this Padlet and there they will have, I've, I have a bunch of those already pre-populated in the Padlet, these barriers. I want you to score them between one and five stars. Please try and score them all between one and five stars uh, because uh, if you don't score it, it'll affect the average because um, in other words, if you feel it's poor and you don't give it a score, that won't affect the average. But if you give it a one star, that will affect the average. So try and score them all. Uh, also, you can add comments to them, but you may have other barriers. Those are the barriers that I've suggested. If you don't like them, give them a one star. If you think they're very serious, give them a five star and so on like that. But you can add your own uh, um, barriers to it as well. But please check that it's not on there already, not to overcomplicate thing. And uh, we'd like your opinions on them. So there's there's potential there to add comments as well. And we will collect all this. Uh, they'll have been collected at the live workshop. And now if you're doing this asynchronously after the event, um, uh, we'll collect yours as well. And maybe I'll get around to doing some sort of a report on it. Am I out of the way there? I better get out of the way of the, the URL there, bit.ly edtech2024bm and that will bring you to the Padlet where we want your scores, your ideas of other barriers and your comments on the barriers. Okay and let's see did we miss anything? Uh, could it be professional associations a bit like the protectionism? Could it be standardization that in the uh, are this happens in a lot of areas that the desire to standardize means that it's very difficult for people to innovate away from those standards. Could it be high expectations that everything we have to do that new has to be top quality, despite the fact that a lot of education in higher education is not top quality uh, uh, before it starts. So it requires too much effort to get it started and get it tested. Could, be, could it be internet access, poor technology access, those types of things. Okay, as I say, Go on and those aren't on the list if you want to add them to it too or add something else to it. Now what I don't think we'll have time at the workshop tomorrow really for because it's only one hour long and it really should be longer is addressing those barriers because essentially is a wicked change, a, a, wicked, a wicked problem. Um, I don't know, uh, here's a few solutions that I'm suggesting but to be honest with you this is much more of a challenge than just uh, identifying the barriers. But we'll see what you come up with. Is it just more money? Now, my personal opinion is often throwing money at a problem doesn't solve it. But if you do invest in the right things, you know, to give people time to work on things, if it's the right things they're working on, uh, then possibly that could do the trick. The question is, what are we given this extra funding for? Will those activities be, will those, will what you spend the money on really have an impact? Could it be to get more competition into the system? Maybe the higher education institutions are all basically copying each other. They're all moving to the mean where nobody is really trying to do something differently or maybe we're, the QA systems aren't allowing them. I'll, I think I had that down here as well. Uh, maybe what we should do is generating more competition between ins institutions and funding what their outputs is rather than the work they've done. So it's not good enough just to have done certain actions to get the money. Those actions must get results. Even within institutions, and I worry about these multi-campus institutions now that are starting up is that, will there be that you're not allowed to do something over here in the institution if it's already been, something similar has been done somewhere else? in the institution. Maybe we need more internal competition within institutions, delegate decision making, allow departments to be autonomous and, uh, and to do their own thing with f financial constraints, I'm sure. Um, uh, or maybe we just need new types of institution. I uh, mentioned degree granting without research. That's, uh, I feel there is a certain conflict between research and teaching. 
So maybe if we separated those, there'd be more innovation in the teaching. Uh, teaching at scale, maybe we should be looking at institutions that will teach thousands of people rather than the class sizes we have. A disaggregation of roles, maybe separate what people do. In it. And, and that in our traditional higher education is sort of the, the lecture does everything, comes up with what the course designs the course, prepares the materials, delivers it, assesses it. Could that be separated? Could we redesign that in a new type of institution? Do we need to look at national regulations? Are there some particular regulations that need to be changed? Our national funding, how we fund? Uh, separation of teaching research, and way I've talked about that, really a new type of institution. But within an institution, we could separate teaching from research. Some of the staff could focus on teaching and some focus on research so that they don't have that conflict of interest. Uh, the decision, could, could we improve the decision-making processes within the existing institutions? Um, much as we all love collegiality and everybody having a say, do we have to give everybody the freedom to say no? Uh, um, we can listen to opinions, but we have to move, make decisions quickly as well. Would autonomy help in that? You know, as I said, in internal competition already, if we gave departments autonomy to make their own decisions, uh, do our quality assurance systems need to embrace uncertainty? In other words, to be able to be able to tolerate risk, and I would say continuous improvement is a better approach in, uh, to to this than than deterministic quality systems. And others, if you've got an idea, let's do it, test it quickly, and show us the proof that it's working, and we'll allow it to continue. Which is essentially an agile approach to doing things. Uh, as I say, uh, get your minimum viable product out. If it's not working, if it looks like a dead duck, kill it. If it looks like it's working but it has problems, improve it quickly. Get feedback from your students and improve it quickly. And the students that are taking it on in the early days should be made aware of the, what would you say, the uh, experimental nature of it. Um, and do we need to change our institutional or national policy, uh, policies to encourage agility? Okay, so you can make some of those I have up in the Padlet. You can score them one to five. You can add others. Be very interested to see what people will do. And of course, make, make comments. Now, the rating of contributions is the most important thing because I want to bubble these to the top. Okay. Uh, but do feel free to add others. And if you think there's ones that I've on there that shouldn't be there, give them the one star and maybe make a comment as to why. And as I say, uh, this could provide some very useful information and might be uh, might be worth me distilling it into some sort of format that I can send out to you. And just before I go, I'll just appear here on the screen again and say goodbye and say thanks for listening to this recording and thanks for contributing. See ya.